Here we go, everybody. Thank you all for coming. Uh, welcome to our uh, council meeting on May 10th, 2023. Uh, first off, let's start off with our land acknowledgement. Uh, before we begin, I would like to respectively acknowledge that we are gathered today on ancestral unceded territory as of the Pescudumic Takati peoples. And next up, I need a move, mover and seconder to approve the agenda for the council meeting. Okay. Councillor Heislip, Second. Councillor Harding. Uh, any questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All good, thank you. And now, is there any questions or comments on from the public for wastewater system or pool deck refurbishment? Move on to mover and second. Oh, uh, to move into uh, discussion on the wastewater system. Yeah. Mover and second. Councilor Wright. Second. Councilor Heislip. Any questions on that? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Now let's discuss uh, wastewater. Too many buttons here. Uh oh. Just bear with me, okay. Uh, I guess I should have said, the council approved the recommendation from Dillon to purchase the three of the Atlas Copco, Copco ZS5 blowers at a cost of $363,699, uh, taxes included. So, so is there any questions or comments or anything you wanna share, Sean, on what we're talking about? Um, I'll just say that um, the, these are slightly larger than what we had. Um, uh, the lagoon is 20 plus years old, um, so increased demand, decreased capacity, a number of uh, factors had put the lagoon near capacity in terms of our ability to, to provide oxygen to it. So it made really no sense to replace the original blowers. Uh, as they were, um, so these blowers are actually, uh, like I said, about 25 to 30 percent greater capacity. That may have implications in terms of what um, the insurance company eventually covers um, because we didn't replace exactly what we had. That's yet to be determined. That'll be an ongoing discussion with them how much of that price they're going to obviously they're going to they're 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 not going to pay for uh, the increased capacity the question is is will they pay 100 percent of the capacity that we formerly had so yet to be determined so we're going to determine that before we purchase we've got to do this regardless okay so it comes down to you know how much are they going to give us towards this and that's unknown at this point all right, any questions, Council? Do we know how much capacity difference there is between the two, just a, a ballpark to so, see what the uh, increase might be? I, sorry, I don't have that right in front of me, but I think it, I've seen to recall it's like 30%, 30% increase in capacity. And we've left room, when we, when we do this, we'll leave room to add another blower down the road if we, if we need to increase capacity again okay any more comments questions all right let's go to a vote a real vote this time not like the one I just did uh, so council approved the recommendation from Dylan to purchase the three of the Atlas Capco Capco ZS5 blowers at a cost of three hundred sixty three thousand six ninety nine uh, taxes in any is anyone all in favor Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Now I'll just get a mover to go into a mover and seconder to move into the next topic for the pool deck. I so move. Council Eastman. Second. Council Greenlaw. Okay. Any discussion on that before we dive into it? Yeah. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, just for uh, the sake of the public as well as uh, councillors that are less familiar with the file, 
Um, we've been trying to <laughs> deal with some failing uh, pool tile for uh, a couple of years now, really. Um, and uh, we've tendered, tendered this project on a number of occasions, got no bidders. Um, just the, the, the industry is busy and uh, whatnot. So we actually had to get special permission to, to sole source this, uh, this project um, from the government. They did, um, they looked at what we had done and, uh, and agreed that it was time to just get this project going and get it done. Uh, the number, what I wanted to really make sure people understand is the number that's in this resolution is uh, the worst case scenario. Um, this would be with none of the cost cutting measures that were uh, discussed in some of the engineers' notes that were in your packages. Um, we all know probably from anybody's own home renovation project, once you start getting in underneath tiles or underneath window walls, you always find more than you expected. Um, so what we're saying here is if we could get approval from the council for the maximum value, um, not only are we going to go after the cost cutting measures that the engineers have suggested, um, which will bring the total cost of the project down, but it will also automatically build in uh, some leeway in case we do encounter some struggles once we get uh, the demolition out, out of the way. Um, this is, uh, as indicated, it's Canada Community Building Fund, generally known as gas tax. Um, for those who are, I don't know that term better, um, which comes in from the federal government, for the province from the federal government through the province to us. Um, we build five-year plans around these projects. Um, currently, there is only there is only two projects uh, on our five-year plan. Um, this will it does affect the longer the, the project that was still further out, uh, but uh, we've talked to our it was uh, actually the King Street uh, pumping station. Um, is the other project that was identified. Our engineers are, are satisfied that that can wait for a little bit while we um, deal with this situation. Um, but uh, we are we're, we th we expect that this project will likely come in closer to six hundred thousand um, by the time that we explore the cost cutting measures um, the engineers have suggested, and uh, you know pending no uh, no big surprises in the project uh, duration. Um, the photos that are here were taken in August 2021, so that's almost two years ago. Has it worsened since then, or? I, I think as, aesthetically, yes, it has. You can see mm -hmm. if you're on the pool deck, whether you swimming or your family swimming, you can see that there are more blue mats out on the pool deck. Um, this is in high traffic areas, so you'll see those coming out of the the changing rooms. Um, it. It is an issue if, if um, you know, we probably could have gone a little bit longer, but it, it, it's not getting any better. No, I'm, I'm just wondering, because I know this won't be done tomorrow, <laughs> like how fast is it deteriorating? Or? Um, it's good. I think the timelines are the, the uh, Acapulco pools who we've been in negotiation with are ready to get this going um, towards, well, as soon as we get your, your blessing, if you go that way, then we'll get the... Uh, to go ahead and, and they'll be able to set more concrete timelines and, and hopefully by late summer, early fall, um, we should be complete. And of course we've got the outdoor pool as a, a supplement right now. So we should be good. Okay, thank you. Uh, Council Um I think I asked this before. Uh, well, I, I did see that crack. That was about four or five years ago. So that doesn't, doesn't seem to be any worse than what is, but I haven't been right up close to it. But what was at fault for this? I mean, this is, what, eight years into a 20-plus million dollar project and and a maximum cost of a million dollars to go and fix a pool deck. Uh, one question I asked before was, was this going to do us for the next 25 years rather than every eight years spending a million dollars and as prices are only going up? I think the answer was, yes, this will should should last a long time. The other was, what was at fault? It was a faulty grout or was it uh or tile substandard product in the initial build I, i'm not exactly sure which ones it was a little bit before my time plus we've installed and, and added new equipment into the pool deck such as uh the diving uh the starting blocks there are some poles that have gone in there um any new additions now you know will be you know include they're all included so we don't need to add anything so this shouldn't be a nine-year annual, uh, you know, reoccurring issue. Uh, 
Councillor Rhodes is probably going to ask this question because she was talking to me about it and hoping I'll steal it from you. But uh, that the cracking in it, I know it's been an issue since we first uh, got into this building. Is that uh, we're going to address that as part of it, or is it just for grouting and tiling? Because well, you're seeing underneath the on the pool deck there the, the cracks that I've seen. In those pictures are kind of going through the the concrete, right? And according to the engineers, once this work is complete, because they will take off so many inches, that, that will remedy the, the issue. So we, we should be good once this is done. And the engineers have said that, and they're recommending this work, so. And is there a guarantee on this work? Um, the, what you can see, I think there is certain... For the products that we're using, um, so I'm not sure if they're 25 years, we, I can go through that and, and check and, and let you know. Warranties, though, on equipment, is sometimes it's like, oh, yeah, they installed it wrong or whatever, right? So they avoid the kind of the warranty anyway. But uh, what about the uh, the person that's going to be doing the work? Have they, they, have they brought up any kind of warranty on their on their work specifically? Or? I think, again, and with, with the, the history of uh, Acapulco Pools and the relationship that um, they've had and the work that they've done, um, IRC Rimkus is the, the, the project manager, the engineers. They've said that they've got a, a good tradition, a good, yeah, that they've done this in, in uh, the maritime provinces. So um, we'll back their judgment and I think they should be good. Thank you. Uh, so the engineers will be here throughout the project, like through different stages and maybe signing it off. Will yeah. they go from one stage to the next? They, they yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Ms. Greenlaw? Uh, are there any <coughs> quality control built in it during the, the, the ins installation process? Is there any, you know, whole points quality control checks or anything like that to make sure that they don't get past a certain point with substandard workmanship? I think once they sign off on, on the project, then, you know, they, they will do their assessment. And that's what they've done, you know, initially when we first hired them, we took, on, took them on because we, even, even uh, Dylan's that don't have the extensive knowledge of working in pool decks, they recommend, recommended uh, IRC Rimkus, so we'll we'll ensure that there are the certainly the quality control tests. Councillor Kevin, just a little history. Uh, I was on the Rollo planner with the Garston Center when they built it, and uh, we had a pool problem then. They decided to put uh, the tiles in. <laughs> Sorry, Kevin. They decided to put the, the tiles down, and halfway through the project, we discovered that they put the wrong tiles down. They refused basically to change them because there was a slippery type tile rather than a, a, a rough tile, and uh, they eventually ripped those out, and they had to put other ones in. So that's where that was. I, I don't know what the warranty on that would be, but that was probably 10 years ago now, I'm assuming. But there's a certain type of tile I'm sure you know more about than I do, but uh, that was a little bit of history. They, we had to replace it before we actually put it down, you might say. They had almost finished. So. Okay, uh, any more questions? Council Rodas? So approximately how long again would the project take and how much would it disrupt service? Would it disrupt service to the pool or would it be blocked off a certain area of the deck type of thing? With, with the uh, heading into the summer, trying to get this work done as soon as possible so we do have the outdoor pool to to cover the level of service with um, we we actually had both pools running last year which was, was great uh, you know options for anybody who especially when you have a bad day outside which we ha tend to sometimes um, but of course then we have to staff both pools which which can be difficult this year we're aiming just to have uh, if, we, if this work uh, were to, to go ahead um, let's say we got it organized and, and they could start with, uh, you know, we're, we're looking at late June, July as the start date for our outdoor pool, then that would, that would be ideal, it would be eight, eight to ten weeks. Barring, of course, any issues that do come up, as we've said, you know, there may be something. Uh, and if we have to extend our outdoor season into, usually we finish the, the last weekend of August, uh, if we have to go into mid to late September, uh, Aaron is prepared uh, to do that. We hopefully will have enough students he's doing some training and we we included that in the budget as well so we would be prepared just in case there was a uh, you know an overlap that or circumstances which we weren't kind of prepared for that we've got the staff to go so 
uh, just another uh, clarification, Kevin, the uh, decommissioning of the power dam in Milltown. I noticed there's a lot of talk about the baseball field and other th activities around that area. Will this demolition interfere anyway at all with the pool, whether it be road blockages or different play things that have to be put in? Access to the, the pool and the pool house is, is as normal. It's, it's just the ball fields and the soccer field that would be affected, sir. Thank you, Kevin. Councilor Otis? Um, I guess my only other question would be, if we didn't pursue this, what would that look like? Or are there alternatives to pursuing it? As in, if we're just looking at our budget, this is a significant cost. Is there any way to cosmetically deal with the issue or does this require, I mean, I would obviously like to go deeper and deal with all of it, but it is a significant cost. So I'm just wondering if budget wise, we just decided it this is a big purchase and we wanted to wait on it. Is that even possible or are the engineers recommending it really be dealt with ASAP? They are, yeah, they are. and there, are, there could be other pro uh, products. Uh, we've, you know, we talked about um, you know, some kind of epoxy that you kind of seal everything in. Uh, the, the, re the engineers recommended you know, this is the way to go. Uh, there's a different tile, which is more like a, a poured tile rather than the ceramic tile, which we, you know, uh, Councillor uh, Cornish alluded to. But they felt this is the one that they've had the best um, experience with in similar projects. This, we, we're sadly not the only one who's had to deal with this. So they recommended go with this, uh, and and with Acapulco's experience, um, you know, they should should get it done reasonably quickly and it won't in interfere hopefully with our level of service too much. Okay. Councillor Eastman. Yes, uh, I, I read this uh, thing from page to page and it explains everything just this uh, clearly, very clearly and uh, I think this is, uh, this is the time to launch. Thank you. Thank you. Good points. Well taken, and 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 also, you know, I appreciate the, appreciate the questions on something like this because it is a big dollar amount. So don't don't be afraid to ask questions. And, and we got another one. Sorry, Councillor Wright. No worries. If I'm understanding correctly, the gas tax fund has already been secured. It's there. It's ready. It's accessible. And it's been this projects. The amount has been allocated for projects, and this just happens to be one. And another one may have to be deferred a little bit, correct? So it's not something that's unexpected in terms of it's unexpected that we have to do it, but it's not like a, we're trying to access funds that weren't already there. Is that correct? Is am I understanding that correctly? Correct. It's uh, the gas tax fund comes in as an annual allotment, um, and it gets essentially uh, banked until the, until we launch a project and draw from those funds. Um, so you're essentially correct. The this project was previously identified. Um, we had hoped a couple years ago that we were going to be able to do this a lot cheaper than, <laughs> than now, obviously, with uh, everything going on in the, in the world as far as costings. Um, so what, essentially what we're doing is adjusting our plan to move more of our funding forward um, to accomplish this task. And then the next project, uh, we may have to wait a little bit for more annual allotments to come in until the next project's fully funded. So we're not l going to lose anything in service as a result of doing this is what I guess what I'm getting at. We're not taking we're not robbing from Peter to pay Paul as the old saying goes. That that's correct. We are simply uh, delaying uh, a hope project a little a little bit until uh, the funding comes in. But nothing no, no negative consequences outside of the uh, the cash uh, coming out of the bank account. Thank you, Council Rodas. Um, how much would be remaining in that fund? If we do this project, what was the total amount that comes um, as far as the gas tax amount that comes to the town? Uh, in the current, in 2023, there's 313,000, I think, that are coming, that's coming to the town. We already have 500,000 approximately in the bank account. So worst case scenario, uh, if you use the entire amount that we have there, basically it'll take all the money that we have for the gas tax funding, uh, money right now. If, if, it's, if it's dropped down to the 600000 as the CA, CAO said, uh, there'll probably be about $250,000 left, $250,000 left that may be used for other projects down the road. So um, last question, promise. Is there any other community projects that this is going to impact in terms of do we have any plans where this is kind of like put a wedge into those plans or do you think that the remaining funds will be enough for us to do some other community projects that are on the radar? 
Um, so the this doesn't affect what would be typically considered a community project. Um, our gas tax fund has historically been solely focused on infrastructure. Um, so it, you know, the, like I said, the other project that's being delayed is, is, is a pumping station. Um, so you, the average uh, citizen won't, won't, it won't really notice that, that that upgrade project has been delayed um, in their day-to-day -day lives. So it's, uh, it's simply, uh, for those of us that are that are involved on the infrastructure side, it is unfortunate that we have to delay that project. We do want to get that project done, um, but uh, our engineers are confident that uh, there won't, you know, we're not expecting any catastrophic failures to, to result uh, by a slight delay. You're shutting that off on her? <laughs> Take that button away. Uh, is there any other questions? Okay. So I had a mover and I had a seconder. The council approve the awarding of the contract to a maximum of $949,665.40, including HST for the Garrison Civic Center pool deck refurbishment to Al oh my God, you guys got the words tonight, Alcapoco <laughs> Pools Limited. Further that funding for this project be drawn from the Canada Community Building Fund Administration is hereby directed to explore any cost-cutting methods in consultation with the project managers. Any other questions before we go to a vote? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. Well, that was a tough one, guys. All right. And now, so, uh, yes, so uh, mover and seconder to adjourn. I move to adjourn. Council Harding, Council Eastman. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Seeing none, bring the council meeting to a close. Okay. So we already did the mover and seconder to go into this committee hall. Or, okay, so let's start with the delegations from the St. Stephen BIA or downtown St. Stephen. Or both, <laughs> whatever you call yourself. <laughs> Kristen. All right. Well, first I'll introduce myself. Um, for those of you that don't know, I am Kristen Cloney. I am wearing my BIA hat tonight or downtown St. Stephen hat. Um, small business owner in town and involved in a couple of different um, committees. Um, and I often will refer, I'm going to point to Jason, I sometimes refer to the chamber and we also have our executive director of the downtown St. Stephen um, here tonight. Heather, um, I'm going to keep this um, really short and sweet and focus specifically on the downtown downtown St. Stephen uh, strategic plan. So we wanted to bring this forward um, basically because at this stage we thought it was a good time for the downtown St. Stephen um, uh, committee to sit down and revisit what our strategic plan is moving forward. We've been through quite a lot. Um, as a council, you guys were kind of revamping and we thought it was a perfect time for us to sit down and kind of refresh our goals. And um, while the, the town was doing it, the municipality was doing it at the same time. Now, I'm used to looking at my screen and flicking and Jeff just informed me that I have to look up there and try to be coordinated. So I'm gonna try my very best um, we did pass the strategic plan on to the council earlier, so I'm not going to obviously take the time to read through each item, um, but we do hope that you had a chance to uh, review it and just kind of get a sense of where we're coming from. There is, uh, in terms of the community, sometimes there is uh, some misconception or there is some confusion over the difference between the BIA, the municipality, and the chamber and what our each of our roles are, so that's why we felt that it was important to kind of present this information. So who we are in terms of geographically, we really represent the downtown. So there's a lot of um, different kind of overlaps, um, but we wanted to clarify that and that is one of our goals as we move forward for, for our citizens and the community to understand as well. But what we do is really focused on four main areas, which is the beautification of the downtown area. Um, that would include um, streetscaping, that kind of thing. Um, marketing, 
um, to our different downtown businesses, economic development within the downtown core, and encouraging and continuing membership. So we have a list of, of accomplishments and we reviewed those accomplishments before we moved forward into setting our new goals for the next three years. We have a three year kind of living document plan. And um, a few key points here in terms of mural projects, shop small initiatives, um, Christmas promotion that we do hand in hand with uh, the chamber. We are, we, I don't do any of the grant writing, that would be Heather, so I make sure that I say that properly. Um, grants for the beautification of the downtown area, so when things like the, um, the bicycle racks pop up, um, the digital sign, those are things, um, in that case, it was um, a project that we got to work hand in hand with the municipality in trying to um, nail down and get awarded type things. Uh, downtown dollars program, so if you're not familiar with that, it is a paper money form that people can buy. We have a downtown dollar blowout sale once a year, and that is an opportunity for um, our community to purchase downtown dollars. I knew it was going to happen. <laughs> I flicked it as quick as I could. Um, for our downtown dollars to be purchased and then used at all of the participating businesses in the downtown downtown core okay so we're back in action up here so um, just a, a very quick and brief look at some of the contributions that were just made in the 2022-2023 um, period so we have art for the people in downtown um, in downtown st stephen um, the we have different um, the skyline black self-watering uh, they were the plant pots down downtown so that is something that we were able to um, contribute we have um, the banners that go on the lamp posts there that was um, possible from grant writing uh, we have some green the bicycle racks as i mentioned before art for the people the sign oval signage that you'll see coming in and out of town um, we contributed and helped with the lobster fest dancing in the street festival um, we distributed again it was we i did not distribute anything heather distributed some free energy efficient kits from mb power which was an initiative they put on that she was able to to get for us and again working with our partners um, the saint stephen area chamber of commerce in terms of our shop local campaigns and our christmas promotion so again here is another just kind of a hit on one of our um one of our biggest, I would say, uh, promotions in the downtown area. You can see the growth of the downtown dollars over the course of the um, its inception in 2020, uh, 2019. So that is a program that is we are continuing to build on, and it's it's great as a as a small business owner who accepts the downtown dollars. What uh, we see from that is it's an opportunity for the downtown when they have the blowout sales, it's an opportunity for people to get a, a discount. So they get to take advantage of the discount and the small businesses downtown get to reap the benefits of that. So it's helping uh, promote the businesses that are downtown as well. So I'm going to just kind of briefly touch on this one. I've already kind of hit on it. We are refocusing on our strategic plan because there is a need for regrouping. Lots of things have happened, global pandemic, economic hardships, lots of different things, and it was time to just kind of reevaluate because our needs aren't the same as they were in previous years. So we are focusing on customer attraction, how we can hit our target markets, how we can engage our members, so what types of ways can we work together, work smarter, and try to get our membership engaged as well as the community what ways can we beautify our space and how can we maintain and build on stakeholder alignment so how can we all work together to collaborate on projects big and small to promote things both big and small and how we can kind of all come together to help that um, I'm not going to go through all of this, but um, it was part of the package. It really just focuses on how we as a team and how our board really focused or how we broke down how we were going to focus on what goals we were going to focus and then how are we going to be able to assess whether or not there is growth and if we've met our goals. So 
I'm not going to bore you with all of this stuff. Um, it's there for, for later and will be eventually on our website for everyone else to see. So we're really just, again, it goes back to empowering our members and working together and being ready for the future in the sense that how do we, how can we start building so that we all read, we're ready for what's next to come. Um, we sat down and we revisited our mission our vision, our values, what we value in terms of collaboration and what is our purpose. All of those things that again, I'm not going to go through with you, but this is where we wanted to focus just to get everyone on the same page. So we've taken our four main areas, customer attraction being one, and we've set some goals alongside there. The reason that we thought it was important to bring this to the group is because a lot of this overlaps with the MDSS. So if we want to improve the impact of our events, we need to work together and what types of events can we be working on together? How can we pr help promote events that you guys, um, you know, that the municipality is doing, how can we help promote that? How can we play a role? How can we let our downtown businesses know things ahead of time so that maybe they have ideas that, you know, again, it's all that collaboration, working smarter, not harder. The ideas come from the downtown businesses. What can we offer them in terms of providing them what they need to make these ideas happen? Um, it was a rebrand for us. So, MDSS is rebranding. It was the perfect time for us to do the same thing. So we need to, we're focusing on updating our social media. We need to update our website. We need to update photography. All of those, thing, all of those things that seem very minor but have a really big impact if we are trying to move forward. We are focusing on developing our marketing plan, content plan, and this is again an opportunity for us to work hand in hand with the MDSS in the sense that there's a lot of projects that we work together on. So just. Um, we had a meeting with uh, Michelle about some events coming up and it was an opportunity where we said, hey, you know what we can do? We can work together on this, this and this. This is a great way for us to promote, you know, your paddle boarding downtown, but it's also a way for us to promote our five or six businesses that are in this area that are focusing on this thing this summer, you know, this promotion or whatever the case may be. So opening those lines of communication and, and making sure that the content is aligned and making sure that we have an ability to share and put that information out, but also are able to link back to the, the MDSS to make sure that all of that information is flowing back and forth and is consistent. We are also building on the downtown dollars. Again, uh, we've been in contact with some ways that we can kind of promote that throughout the town and we're looking forward to what that might look like in the future. And we'll be focusing a lot on our participation metrics and kind of media marketing, going back and evaluating and doing all that analysis stuff. So we're trying our best to really attract both the businesses, but also just our community to the downtown core and doing that in a way that all the stakeholders are involved. So the next of the four big keys that we focus on is beautified space. So we are hoping to and have been in discussions to work with the MDSS to support their key projects along with ours. So this goes along with signage. Um, at the time that we wrote this, it was the digital sign was still up in the air. Um, it is now in place and operational. So that is an example. And just on a quick side note from that, this is exactly one of the reasons this, the sign is, the digital signs, excuse me, is it, um, a good example of why the communication is so important. When you have something like that, and um, that was a, that m more than one person is working on, it helps provide our citizens with the proper information of where that came from, um, how it's funded, why it's around. Um, so a lot of times you'll see comments like, the sign is beautiful, but why aren't we filling in potholes? Or that is lovely, but how come we don't have this? The information and being able to put this stuff on social media and also put it out into the community helps to remedy that because then people have the information and information is key. So that is part of the, the reason um, why that is up there. Um, so projects like the Plaza Project, um, streetscapes, art for the people projects, uh, murals, Canada First Basketball, the Coastal Link Trail, any way that we can, we'd love to be able to work together to promote those and knowing, kind of having the insight and knowing what's coming up, we wanna be there to kind of be the cheerleader, but also give our downtown core ways or offer up some information on how we can work together. Improve physical elements of the visitor experience. 
we need to do simple things, um, seasonal, special occasions, low, low effort, um, but high engagement to get our community involved. We know that they like to be involved. We know they're there. We see them on, on social media, so we need to be able to provide some more opportunities there. And we need to leverage our special occasions for improved visitor and member engagement. So it's as simple as that, to explore the low cost ways to get people engaged, whether that is physically getting into businesses, if it's just you know providing a recommendation online. There's so many different ways that people can get involved and we want to try to get that up and running. Something as simple as signage downtown that might have for our visitors, uh, take your picture here, you're standing in Canada, but United States is behind you. Just little kitschy things like that that get people you know, out and get them asking questions. Our member engagement, we're working on our surveying our members, asking them what their needs are and providing them a, a spot to give us their input and actually taking that information, reviewing it, assessing it, and seeing how we can help them. Education, so we've been working on uh, lunch and learns with the chamber and providing different educational courses based on their needs. And this is another example of working, working together. There could be other options out there, opportunities out there where we could um, increase engagement by working together. Engage our members, again, communication channels, asking for feedback and the such. So the last but not least kind of core element of our strategic plan is the stakeholder alignment. This brings us to exploring our grant opportunities, making sure that there's an open line of communication so that we have the opportunity to help enhance and improve so there could be projects that we can work together on, um, federal and provincial elected projects as well and uh, I can just kind of squeeze this information in here we know that we have uh, provided this information and you may have even seen it on the news that downtown New Brunswick has been awarded a yearly $500,000 grant that we are with a deadline of May 31st so not a lot of time um, but those different um, grants the different types of approval for their rec uh, requirements fall into a few different categories and our group is meeting next week to sit down and try to hammer out kind of the final big projects, the key go-fors that we want to we want to tackle. The main one being marketing in the sense that we'd really love to get some more marketing material and focus on our website and make sure that this information is provided. It doesn't matter who you are or where you are, you'll be able to access this information. Uh, work with our community partners to expand our reach. We need to be able to increase our partnerships with different uh, tourism and event committees, participate and support in with our working partners, and develop new creative projects and uh, with our working partners. So, and again, just our membership. We need to be able to communicate with our downsta downtown, downstairs, downtown St. Stephen property owners and be able to relay all of this information. So that is kind of our strategic plan in a nutshell. I know some of that is not super exciting information for some of you, so I do appreciate um, everyone taking the time to, to hear us out. But again, we just want to reiterate that the main part of that and the main reason for us being here is the key element of communication. So we were very fortunate and appreciative. We were a part of, we were able to be a part of the strategic planning meeting for the town. And that was a great opportunity for us to have that element of communication and see how important it is kind of moving forward. From that meeting, we've been able to reestablish meetings where we meet with the town. Um, so we've been able to have a meeting with Future St. Stephen, with Michelle, with the Chamber. So kind of all of our working members, all the, stakeholder, all the stakeholders kind of working together. And from one meeting, um, we've had multiple ideas pop up. Um, so even, even if it's just information sharing, one of the ideas that came up was the chance to do something like a... I'm going to see, Jeff, if I can remember what you told me to do, which involves me to be... I need to be... Um, I need to be coordinated enough to operate this screen from over here <laughs> backwards. Okay. Um, so just something like this, um, this is a rough draft and is not a final draw, but it is, um, an event that we are trying to work together on right now to promote locals, but also it could be for day trippers. We are trying to focus it um, to, to really be suitable for both. 
a fun little summer bucket list. It is, we're working with MDSS, uh, Michelle, MDSS, to have this fun little summer bucket list checklist where whether you're from out of town or you're in town, you will have the summer to check off at least 10 of these activities, um, all downtown core. It's a way to promote um, the different events that the town has operational, but also um, our downtown core businesses. So just a fun little way to enter into a giveaway to get people physically into stores. Doesn't necessarily mean it has to be a purchase, but a way to people get it, to people to get out and to explore our area. And we would love to be able to continue this for each season. So have a quarterly event where we can eventually start to expand and um, include both the chamber and more of our MDSS, obviously. Um, so with that, that is um, the end of my little presentation that ran a little bit longer than I wanted it to, so I do apologize, but I do believe that this is just the beginning. We're very thankful that we've been able to reestablish those meetings and moving forward, just having everyone you know, in the know of what we are doing, but also in what ways we can be helpful to the MDSS. That's it. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, okay, uh, no questions or comments? Yeah, of course, Councilor Rodas. Well, first off, I just wanna thank you guys for your work, especially Heather, shout out for um, the sign downtown. It actually is wonderful when I drive by every day. We might need to put a sign on the sign that says this sign was funded by. Um, <laughs> but it's just been fantastic. And I think another thing I've noticed downtown is the murals are so beautiful. And I've had a lot of comments about the wall murals. So I'm excited to hopefully see if some more of those pop up. Um, but I'm just really excited about the future of our downtown core. I think it's a, it's a good time for us, especially with this new grant coming, to look at these bigger ideas and really just go for it. It. My only other question was if there's somebody in community who has an idea because people do approach you as a counselor and say I really want to see this downtown um, would there be an opportunity in your marketing on your website to even have like a kind of a feedback form or a contact form where if a citizen approaches us we could say why don't you go to the BIA downtown St. Stephen website and just submit that idea um, just to get some community engagement with this funding coming I think it would be really unique to kind of see what the citizens of the downtown core and the full MDSS um, would like to see kind of happen there's a lot of feedback that's given between future St. Stephen and downtown St. Stephen with that. So people have the opportunity, if that came about, would have the opportunity to directly message either or and the fact that they're close and just across and um, that kind of stuff comes up in the board meetings all the time even if it's just a business needs a location or a business has an idea but they need to hammer out this this and this like the, all of that information does come across the desk quite often um, providing or having a location for kind of a comment section would be would be good on the website but also definitely until then you know, promoting the the option to just reach out to to Heather or to like I said, the information going to Future St. Stephen is is critical too, and is great now because we're all meeting and sitting together and sharing that information. So, definitely helpful. Council Wright. I saw in that colorful graphic. It's great. Thank you. Um, I was axe throwing in downtown St. Stephen. Seriously? Oh, I didn't know that existed. That is that is serious. Um, that is Michelle. <laughs> so I'm I'm passing that one back. Uh, I don't have here her. I don't have her here to. But it will be one of the events happening on um, on the August fourth, I believe. So and it's yeah during International Festival. So that draft um, we were we did kind of one and we we targeted. We were trying to target locals, just trying to get locals out and about. But as we started it, we said, well, wait a second. We can get locals, but how could we get all of the events to be doable in a day trip? So that if we posted this online, so if this is something that we work together on and we we post it on our page and it gets posted on social media and all the different avenues, maybe we could encourage people that are coming from the day. Um, to try to hammer this out too, and then maybe they can enter to you know you know win the prize. And so we may have to change the axe throwing because that's only going to be available on one day. So I have all of the things for that. <laughs> now I, now I'm feeling a little like we need to keep it. Um, but that is kind of it was it, that's what happens. The idea started and then it just kept growing. Very very low cost 
way to try to increase engagement. So, thank you. I just I thought you meant, I thought it, it existed somewhere and I hadn't heard about it yet. I was all excited. <laughs> Be out to take your picture. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I think you must have missed the memo because that's uh, we're also uh, putting council members out and they got to throw the axes around us. <laughs> oh, there <Yeah>. you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Councilor Heislip. Yeah, I tried the axe throwing. I never hit it once. So. <laughs> um, a couple questions. Now, it's voluntary, right, the membership? Yes. So you can opt out of it or opt into it. I always get hazy around BIA and Chamber of Commerce as well because it's kind of... Um, yeah, it kind of overlaps, I think, a little bit. There's a lot of our a lot of our projects overlap. Um, Heather and Tara, the executive director of Chambers, share an office, so that also um, could be an, a factor. Um, we definitely work together on a lot of projects, but I think the there are very specific. It's actually why we were very specific in this project being the BIA and the MDSS to to kind of refocus on what the BIA is. And that it is downtown St. Stephen. So we agree that kind of hazy, foggy, unknown lines is what we really want to work on. Okay, and then, the BIA is under a geographical area. Yeah, so that's my next next question. It was it's on a geographical? I never did, I did so, understand the geography so of how it was, it was. So like high tides, like the St. Stephen Inn, um, but now that's not. Um, that's not that's the business. It's it's right residential. So we'll lose the levy on that. So you go from high tides. Down King Street, Bud Avenue, and then down to Milltown Boulevard. To it was where June Greenlaw had her hair salon. So it, it's now just um, well where the music vault is. Do you know where I mean? The old A and R building, not the old A and R, the old A E Horn building. That's the area, and so we have a levy. Um, 20 cents per $100 assessment and we were created in 1984 so we this BIA has been active since 1984 okay so the question was <laughs> the question was what about somebody that's just off that beaten path that wants to take advantage of promoting promotions and welcome kits and the downtown dollars like, how do you go about to increase, if you want to increase membership, can you increase the geography of the business? Because I know businesses just off the beaten path that, that are not, not part of this, and they don't feel like they're part of it. Yeah, just. You know, good conversations with business owners, right? right. Yeah, they so. They feel like they feel that they could support every, they want to support every business in the community. They think they should all be supported, but they don't feel like they're getting any support because they can't be part of the BIA. So hold on. Uh, so Heather, can you come out the podium because the, the no one else is going to hear you, and that is important to hear that because we we've we we talked about it before how the geographical area works. Just wait, wait, wait to get the podium. So uh, RBIA is described a certain way. If we wanted to extend out towards the the mall area, a second BIA would have to be created, and so you have to have those businesses agree that they will um, agree with the levy. I can't, we cannot extend the BIA that we have right now. Now, I've been told that we can extend this way, so we could include the hotel and down that way, but I cannot extend out towards the mall, and that's come from the province. But what about the little offshoots of Milltown Boulevard and of King Street that their business is on? So, like, what what businesses are you like saying? Here, I'll, I'll give an example: the uh, the New Union Station, for example. So, um, well, she's not in the levy um, or the geographical area. She would. Ha I would have to uh, go to the province and ask them if I could extend that area to there. But she would have to agree to the levy. And then she would be able to, um, you know, be on our website and, and have the downtown dollars. Um, when it was, um, when we were created in 1984, 
Dave Lyons owned the Riverside Grocery, and he was adamant he did not want to be involved. So that is why Riverside Grocery is not included, because it would have been easy to take in that small business at the, at the time. I think the other thing that's important, too, is in the, in the meantime, I mean, just like everything, there's rules and regulations, and, and you could try to figure out if you can make some of those exceptions work. But one of the other key factors that we don't want to, to miss is that this is just the BIA. The chamber, which anyone can be a part of, is involved in almost every one of the activities that the BIA does, except for this single event that we're doing right now, um, because we were trying to specifically focus on on kind of the, the strategic downtown core working with the MDSS. But there are many, many opportunities within the, it's not to say that we, it can't happen, that's outside of my pay grade, I volunteer. Um, so I don't know the answers there. Mm -hmm. um, but that the, the chamber and the BIA work on a lot of uh, activities together. So the Christmas promotions, even, even this little bucket list idea, we wanted to be able to expand in the fall to include the chamber as well. So just kind of building on it, but as a test run, wanted to start small and focus on, on the BIA. That's who we are, right? And the, business that, the businesses that are put on the bucket list for this one were downtown businesses that participated in the Christmas promotion. So that's how they got chose this, this time. It's just a, yep. you know. Okay. But I mean, if, if well, just like what Kristen said, yep. it, any business outside of the BIA, they can join the chamber and, and, uh, and join the foggy <laughs> well, uh, well, I think they can join the foggy area, but it still doesn't, like the downtown business dollars, people come in and they want to spend them in their store and they say, sorry, we don't belong to the BIA. And I think that'd be part of your strategy would to be reach out to the members. Maybe that uh, the person that owns uh, the uh, Riverside Grocery wants to be part of, that can increase your membership there or it can increase your membership of any of the little side businesses that you might come up with. I don't know. That's just a suggestion yeah. anyway. So. Yeah. Well, anyway, we, we got the presentation in and we, we can work with that. And then we got our counselors on that on that committee there. You can uh, talk some more about maybe with him and get that stuff rolling. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming to the podium, Heather. <laughs> And I will say, Heather can write up a, a funding uh, proposal up pretty quick because we put her to the test there one time. You did it today, so. Yeah, well, <laughs> I'll, I'll get it for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. Next up, uh, MB Power presentation. No. No. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Full disclosure, as I was coming up here, I reached into my pockets and I don't have my glasses. And I, and I, and I like to think that I'm not old enough that I need them, but no, no, I think I'm okay. I, I won't be able to see the screen, but I can see my notes. Uh, first of all, Your Worship, Council Members, thank you for the opportunity to present to you the status on the, Mil on the Milltown project. Next slide, please, Jeff. Uh, my name is Phil Landry. I'm the Executive Director of the Project Management Office and Engineering for MB Power. Next slide, please. So lots of stuff happening on the project, and I think you folks all understand that this project is sitting on an international border, which makes things what I call exciting. Uh, lots of permetry on both sides, lots of regulatory um, licensing that we, need, that we need to get, a lot of permits that we need to get, and those kinds of things. Uh, this includes uh, work with the EIA to make sure that we have everything that we need in place from a New Brunswick side to, uh, to uh, do the project. The main Department of Environment Protection Condition and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. In addition, we submitted further project modifications to the main Department of Environment Protection for consideration. So just to, to, to bring you sort of up to speed, when we did the estimates on the project, we had to decide or had to determine how we're going to actually do this. But when we actually went out to get estimates or when we went out to, uh, to get uh, to through procurement to get uh, uh, the tender out to get somebody to do, actually do the work, they presented something that's a little bit different than what we actually bid the project on, right? 
So now we have to take that information and bring it back to the regulatory to the regulators just to make sure that it still falls within sort of the 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 the, the umbrella of the permit if you like. Next slide please. So decommissioning update. So uh, we engaged Pentagon uh, through a comprehensive procurement process uh, to actually do the decommissioning work. So Pentagon have been doing this kind of work for about 50 years. Lots of experience with this kind of work and we're very confident that they can help us uh, perform this work appropriately. Work is progressing on the various plans to support decommissioning including the traffic report which was recently shared with the CAO. You may be aware of the work crane which was moved on site in late February, I don't know if you've seen that, and then there'll be some more movement on site in uh, the, end of, uh, the end of May, May 24th. Uh, from an environmental perspective, we continue to work on the various conditions as set out in the regulatory approval. Uh, we just received the noise monitoring report and our consultant Dylan indicated that the baseline results collected in June of 2022 uh, are a little higher than anticipating than anticipated given the suburban nature of the area. So the noise levels were a little bit higher than what we actually anticipated. They do meet the daytime guidelines value at all locations, but, but most nighttime results except for one receptor exceeding the guidelines values. And again, we attributed these levels to road traffic on Milltown Boulevard, right? Uh, we carried out field studies, uh, the pre-nesting bird survey. Uh, phase three environmental site assessment water sampling is underway and as well as testing is anticipated to start in mid-May. Next uh, slide please. So continuing with the environment update and environment, environmental site assessment when condu was conducted in 2022. This is a standard approach on determining the presence or absence of contaminants and is a condition of our EIA. Uh, based on historical data, the area is of environment concern because it was formerly occupied by the cotton mill from, 19, or from 1881 to 1970. Not used to saying that 1880s number. <laughs> uh, the site was assessed as residential agriculture, which is the most conservative criteria in the provincial guideline for contaminated sites. Next, site, please, or next slide, please. So you'll see here, this is an interesting slide. It's a slide from back in 1962, or a picture from 1962. And I'll bring your attention to the red lines around sort of the site. That's actually the decommissioning project uh, area. And then I don't know if you can see well there, but you can see, and I'm gonna try to see without my glasses. Um, there's the, the down on the right, or down, down low on the right hand side, you've got, um, where the, the mill used to be, there's the, the coal pile used to be there. Down a little bit further, you'll see a waste oil area. Uh, anyway, you can see that when we actually are looking at the site and doing testing on the next page, which I'll share with you, uh, there are areas of concern based on what the site was used in, in the past, right? Next, next slide, please. That screen behind you helps you. Oh, look <laughs> that. No, I appreciate that. So th this is an interesting slide here because if you look at the legend, and I don't know if you folks can actually see it, but again, you'll see the red line around the whole outskirts of the, of the project. But you'll see there's a legend there that shows essentially what was in those areas. So if I point you to uh, bottom sort of right, you'll see like a purple, and that purple was the coal pile. Right? So when we we're doing our testing to understand what contaminants might be in the area, we use this information to sort of guide us to try and understand what contaminants might be in those areas. Okay. Next slide, please. So not surprising, the results of the environmental site assessment indicated that the concentration of contaminants in, uh, in on-site uh, soil and groundwater exceeded provincial guidelines. So we weren't surprised by that, again, just based on the information that we had of what was there on the site in the past. In accordance with the provincial guideline for historical contaminant sites, the site was registered with the Department of Environment and Local Government. This opens a remediation file, and we're in the process of developing the various options for the site. We just recently installed fencing 
to control the site access for the properties, including the ball and soccer fields, and notification for closure of the ball and soccer fields, along with the picnic uh, area was provided. And we do want to thank uh, the municipality for posting the closure notice uh, on their website. So we appreciate that. Decommissioning activities will continue as planned. We hope to start early July once the spring fish migration is complete. Next slide, please. And our goal is to have multi-fish passage in place for April 2024. So we actually have to make sure that we don't interfere with the fish passage. We want to make sure that we continue to allow fish passage. So we're starting sort of at the end of the fish passage this year and want to stop or want, want to finish by the start of the fish passage next year. Again, thank you for the opportunity to provide this, uh, this presentation. Uh, there is more information that's available on our webpage. And if you have any questions that you want to email us, uh, you can certainly do that at milltownproject at mvpower.com and certainly open to answer any questions that you have tonight. Thank you, Philip. Uh, any questions, Council? Mr. Councilor Greenlaw. Yeah. Yes, on, when you talk about the, you know, the contamination levels being higher, any specific types of contamination? Are we looking at heavy metals? Are we looking at? Yeah, there's a number of things, uh, Councilor Greenlaw, that uh, that was found. I'm just looking for my notes here. What I'm looking at is during, during the, you know, when you're digging or when you're just, you know, disturbing the soil, I'm looking at air quality. Especially around the school and and you know the, the neighborhoods. The neighborhoods are fairly close there, yeah, so absolutely. so we're going to have a, uh, a procedure or process for anybody that's working on site to make sure that they have the proper PPE and a proper understanding. Uh, there's no indication at this point that there's any aerial issues outside of the of the uh, construction area, uh, so we're going to keep a really close eye on that. Yeah, you check your buffer zone is. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, any more questions? Yes. Uh, Councilor Harding? Councilor Harding? Thank you, Your Worship. Um, yeah, uh, just a quick one. You mentioned noise. Yeah. Since I live in the area that you could throw a rock from my place to the dam, yeah. uh, are you going to be working at night? No, no. So okay. the hours of work are 10 to 12 hours, Monday to Saturday. Right. Yeah, no, no, uh, no night. Councilor? Yeah. Just a question. You mentioned the ball field and the picnic area. That's going to be totally removed? Or are you going to replace it after you tear it out? Yeah, so, so we don't exactly know right now what we're going to do because we don't know what the, uh, the end state of the, the site's going to be used for. Once we understand what the site's going to be used for, then we would base our remediation of the contaminants based on that. So there's still a lot of work to be done there. You're welcome. Well, that brings me to a question, so thanks for bringing that up. So what if you don't replace the ball field? At that location, is there gonna be consideration at another location? We are certainly open to that, uh, Mr. Mayor, um, but we haven't had any discussions on that at this point. Go ahead, Council Cornish. Just another question. Uh, that is the oldest power station in Canada. There's, I see there's some remnants down there. Apparently it was rope operated off the actually turbines in those days, what they're made of probably wood, I don't know. Is there any chance that you people are going to put up a, let's call it a mini museum or some sort of a replica of that? Because I feel real bad that the dam is being torn down and we're gonna be left with a set of rapids with no indication that there was anything ever there. And this is a historical property that nobody else has in Canada. This is no different than the basketball court. We're the only ones that had the first basketball court. And in Canada, we're the only ones that had the first power operated dam. So I'm very strongly oriented that NV Power is replaced something down there to make it look like it used to, not to the magnitude, of course, the part it is. But uh, we should have a place there that, same as the two statues, you might say, at, uh, in front of the Catholic Church that looked down where the cotton mill used to be. Uh, there's just going to be no remnants and anything was ever there. So I'm really concerned about that because we're depending on tourism, hopefully building it along with some of your things tonight, that we have 
We'll have no indication there was anything ever there. So I'm really big on, let's build something that showed or demonstrated how this thing actually operated. That's it, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, uh, our Council Cornish. Uh, did you, yeah, yes, sure, yeah, sure, please. Um, so we certainly recognize that uh, the Milltown Station is is a legacy in this area, and we've had we, we've had three CEOs since uh, since we've announced this, and all the CEOs are saying the exact same thing that we need to find a way to recognize that. Now we have a couple of committees. We have a committee that uh, that the Community Liaison Committee, which is a committee that I don't think any of you sit on, but. Uh, uh, certainly it's a committee that that allows us to share information and and get information as well from them from that committee there's from that committee there's a subcommittee as well which we call heritage legacy committee i think is what we call it and it's really just about that it's really making sure that we're doing the right thing in terms of leaving the right legacy behind so there's a lot of work going on on that i just want to touch one on one thing is the, the rope turbine um, i think we all feel the same way the rope turbine is something that i'd, I'd never seen before Rope turbine hasn't been at Milltown for a long time, but we still have it, right? Yes. And what we want to do is find a way to display that. Don't know where at this point, but it is really something that even our folks that have been around for a long, long time appreciate that technology, and, and we don't want to lose the, the opportunity for people to continue to, to at least see it, right? Sure, go ahead, Brian, or Council Cornish, sorry. <laughs> it's okay, Brian's all right. <laughs> uh, I gotta be honest, up front, I'm a little disappointed that we got down to this point. Your plan doesn't seem to be, we're starting to tear this thing down in July, but it doesn't, like this <laughs> museum, we'll call it for now, it's not in the plan. Uh, the ball fields, there's no plan to replace it, it's a lot of, what ifs. So I expect to see a hole in the ground at the end. There's a bunch of water coming down through it, and NB Power walks away. I'm really disappointed that there's not an answer to those basic elements. I appreciate those comments. Um, in terms of the ball field, uh, you know, that's information that we got at the end of December, or January timeframe. Uh, we have engaged Dylan. Uh, as a consultant with us to try and understand what can be done with, uh, with, with the ball field and, and the other uh, pieces of land in that area. This is still fairly new. And once we understand what the end goal will be and after having discussions with, with the community, uh, then we'll be better placed to be able to put a plan in place to find some way to remediate. Now again, it doesn't mean that the ball field could be there Maybe you can, maybe you can, um, but there still needs to be some work done before we can actually reach those decisions. Go ahead. Uh, I'll be blunt to the point, <laughs> coming from an engineering background. The bottom line is, I don't think you should be allowed to proceed 30 days or 40 days from now without your entire package put together. You're coming in, basically say you're gonna take it out, but you're not telling us what's gonna replace it or enhance it. We're gonna end up with a bunch of mud that's gonna be bulldozed into the wherever. Got some contaminated soil, we're not sure what we got. We're, we're gonna lose a ball field. You're gonna use a place where kids slide. And uh, the picnic area, well, that's a nice place to look now, but I don't know what's gonna look like after. It's a bunch of water run down over, maybe some rocks, I'm not sure it's gonna be left. But I. I would suggest, suggest I guess the only word we got, that basically you postpone the decommissioning of that until you come up with an entire plan of what's gonna look like afterwards. It's like tearing down a hotel. You're gonna tear it down and build, build a new one? Well, if you're gonna build a 20-story one, you would have lots of architectural designs of it. Right now, we have nothing. You show a river, you show things, things there that's in current there, but what's this gonna look like and what's it gonna do? That, that contaminant thing really bothers me too because I haven't heard of that. But uh, I know the soil around there is probably pretty well contaminated from the wood of the mill because uh, 40 years ago or more, we had some pile of contaminants come down. It was so bad that it actually took the 
I can remember in high school coming to work downtown and seeing all the paint falling off houses because it was lead-based paint. Therefore, it was sulfuric acid in that river. So I would almost suggest that some of that soil that's around there it could be contaminated still. Anyway, that's the bottom line is. I don't think you should be allowed proceeding yeah. until you come up with an entire plan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, yeah, so, so Council Corners, uh, so, some of your, uh, your topics of discussion have been all fought out in the past. And I know you're just you're new at the table here now but they have been all fought out and and then we got to where we're at today so yeah yeah uh if you f feel you want to comment yeah i'm just going to make the comment that i i appreciate where you're coming from uh the clc and the heritage committee have been meeting for goodness a year and two years so this has been an ongoing conversation with the folks um you know the 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 land that's on the ball field needs to be dealt with regardless of what happens right because initially when we were going to do uh, as part of the project the ball field wasn't even going to be touched in fact we were making arrangements to make sure that you could continue to use the ball field but obviously with the information that we got in in uh, december january uh, you know we had to change change those decisions so i i, I do appreciate your comment but uh you know, we've been working at this for for a long time, as as your worship indicated. So, so yeah, I, I just, let me have it just for a sec. Uh, the ball field is is new to me as well, like just in the recent. Uh, and and my concern is uh, there, there there's some uh, Hall of Famers that played on that field and built that field, actually. So there is some history there too. So I want to make sure that everyone considers that as well, in their process. To, so, Council, just uh, one comment. I am on the Legacy Committee is representing council so if there's any questions or comments or suggestions i'm sure that that committee would be more than appreciative of of it and uh, personally i know that it was millions of years that there was nothing on that river so i am a biologist background and an engineer so i don't know whether to save it or pave it and that's my dilemma in all projects that have to do with that but you know it's it'll i think it'll look nice down there after and uh, you know and you and all the things with poly aromatic hydrocarbons and air quality is all covered in the eia and you have to have all that dotted and and t's crossed and that so and, and we will work with the community and the neighbor and the neighboring uh, area to make sure that what's left behind is acceptable just shortly yeah because we had to get some new new stuff but go ahead uh I've, I've heard it all here again tonight i still do not see any evidence i heard the word goodwill but i've heard goodwill in the past also uh i still am opposed to basically starting to decommission that plant with what you said today tonight the toxins in the soil lack of replacing the uh, the monument or what you call a museum and the tearing and losing a baseball field without a firm commitment that that's going to be addressed your plan is not complete and i'd like to see actually a drawing of what it's going to look like when your plan is done you got about a little less than 30 days to complete that so i'm asking that to be done end of story uh well, do you want any home comment or? No, I, I, I'll just continue to reiterate that we, we have the commitments from our CEO and uh, it's our intention. We commit to making sure that the area is left in an acceptable state. Okay, Council Rodas. Uh, I'm, I don't actually live in the area of Milltown, but I do know a couple people who are sitting on those committees and they have shared that MB Power has been extremely collaborative, um, more so than they thought they would be. Um, so I would recommend, Councillor Cornish, maybe you do want to head up to, and sit on one of those committees, especially the one that's, because I would imagine the ball field would be a topic of discussion on that, per, which particular committee would that be discussed on? the heritage uh, committee yeah so the heritage committee i think that would be a really good idea if councillor cornish sat on that committee and um yeah i i would i also agree i think there needs to be some representation of the heritage of that area um and I think it would be really nice if, if you're okay with it as well, if we can let um, the community of Milltown know that email that you shared, is that for any community member? Like if any community member approaches council and says, where are things at? I have concerns about the ball field. Are you open to them reaching out via 
email? Um, and can we assure that you're going to connect with them right away on that? Is there somebody kind of in that role, the communication role? Yeah, okay. We do have that. And, and I'm happy to leave my business card, and if people want to call me directly, I'm absolutely okay with this. Yeah. Council Cornish? Uh, I appreciate uh, Councillor's input. I appreciate being invited on another committee. I don't think I'd want to work on it. It's a done deal. The bottom line, you have no completion to your plan, and it's not going to change. The horse has gone to the barn. Thank you very much, NB Power and the rest of the government, but we're going to end up with a I have no what. I don't know what you're even going to have there at the end of it. So that's my last comment. I think that it's already been decided long before I got here that she's coming out and there's going to be nothing left but water run down over rocks. And I think we're losing a lot in our community. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, let's end it. <laughs> yeah. That's been a long old fight, uh, and, and I can understand the frustration by a lot of people. So it's been a fight, but the fight is over. Uh, okay. Thanks so much, Philip. Okay, so next up, the Retiree Employment or Employment Agency. Hi everybody. Hello. <laughs> I'd like to thank you, uh, Your Worship and Council, for allowing me to be here today and speak. I will guarantee that my topic is much less contentious than our previous speakers. <laughs> and I hope that I can answer all of your questions. So next slide, please. So the Retiree Employment Agency is actually uh, just uh, a brand new project with Working NB, um, the province of New Brunswick, and it's hosted at a variety of agencies across the province, and Kaleidoscope Social Impact out of St. John is serving the Southwest region. And um, in my role, I don't think I said my name, my name's Leslie Parham and I'm a pairing agent, I serve Charlotte County. So um, I just started in February and we're doing some, already doing some fabulous work that I'd like to share with you. So next slide. So our mission really is to support retirees who wish to re-enter the, the market, and we'll t I'll tell you why it's important that they do, to help support businesses with their short-term labor needs. Um, and it's a really collaborative and supportive process um, and very different than anything that Working MB has ever offered before. So you can read the quote, but what I'd like to point out actually is in 2021, there were uh, 342,000 New Brunswickers who were 50 and over, and 59% of the, that population were not in the labor force. So you can look at that two ways. You can say, well, maybe they don't want to be, or you could say that's an untapped market for our small, medium, and large businesses. Next slide, please. So this has been a project that's been in um, a development since 2019. And it started in Edmonston, actually. Uh, they met, had a working NB forum with retirees and employers um, and identified that this was an, a potential uh, uh, market to address. So in Edmonston in 2021, they had a pilot. Um, they had their very first retiree employment agency. Their goal was to fill 25 vacant positions in Edmonston alone, and they filled 60. So um, they exceeded their goals. And then in 2022, September 2022, they did expand the project province-wide, and it is in eight regions. And we, as I said, support the southwest New Brunswick area. So how do we do this? I'm going to tell you. <laughs> Next slide, please. So it d does require a registration process, and there's a reason for that, but we pair registered retirees with registered businesses in, in um, need of experienced workers. So right now we're in our recruitment phase, and I, I'm here for a specific purpose, which I'll reveal later. But we're in our recruitment phase of our retirees and employers, especially in, in uh, Charlotte County, because this project started in St. John um, in September, and very wisely Kaleidoscope said, hey, we need to have a dedicated person in Charlotte County. Then we, um, after we've registered uh, businesses and retirees, we identify what their bo both of their needs are, which is a 
it's a lengthy process, but really important. So that when we get to the part where we're pairing the retiree with the business, we hope that it's a solid match. We've already screened the retiree for um, what they're capable of, what they're interested in, what their needs are. Can they work during the day? Do they want to avoid working at night? Um, I had a retiree tell me that they didn't want to drive from St. Stephen to St. Andrews at nighttime. Anybody want to guess why? <laughs> so, but that's a real um, conversation. And sometimes, uh, you know, when p applicants are presenting themselves for an interview, that's not a conversation they're having with a potential employer. After we make that match, we're following up with both people to make sure that it's a, su it's a, a successful process. Next slide. So why retirees? I'm a retiree. Um, what we bring are skills, knowledge, and talent. We possess critical thinking. Um, statistically, we stay in jobs longer. We have a strong work ethic, and we traditionally also statistically have fewer sick days. The other piece is that we can also mentor younger employees. There are really good studies that talk about mi mixed age groups. Um, I've been working a lot with the tur tourism industry in St. Andrews. Um, they traditionally target younger individuals because they, rightly so, but think that there are some reasons that seasonal worker work attracts younger individuals, but mixed age teams are actually more productive. So here are some of our business partners, the City of St. John, the Town of St. Andrews, the National Port Services, Algonquin Resort, Boys and Girls Club, Commissioners, Heart and Stroke Foundation. I have a list of many more, some that just came on, Connors Brothers just came on with us. Um, uh, uh, Stewart Farms here. Um, so a number of local businesses and uh, larger provincial-wide businesses have already signed up with this project. These are our businesses in Southwest region. So uh, just to stay on this slide for a second, Jeff, just to say that my goal is I would like to report back <laughs> by the end of this quarter in June, not by the end of this meeting, but the end of this quarter in June that I have all municipalities in Charlotte County signed up with this project. And we have already been successful in matching retirees with the town of St. Andrews with some of their seasonal roles at the museums. Um, and I think that uh, it's a real opportunity for you to um, meet some people who aren't even looking to you as an, a potential employer. They don't even know what op opportunities are available. Next slide. Um, so what it would mean simply is that there's a registration form. I have a conversation with you or you provide job descriptions that identify what your specific labor needs are. And we recruit the retirees. We recruit the labor force. Working NB and the Retiree Employment Agency are recruiting the workforce. We're screening them for their skills and what their desired work is. If they need um, help, which I am finding there's a lot of people who may be working for the same employer for 27, 28, 20, 29 years, never have done a resume, never been on a job interview, don't understand what the process is. Many of the jobs that they would like to apply for are online. I've sat with people in our library here um, uh, at the computer walking through the steps to apply online. So um, it, it's, a, it's a different challenges for different people, but we really provide uh, hands-on service. And the last little thing on there says our service is free. There is no cost for this for either the business or the retiree. Next slide, please. So yeah, St. Charlotte County, the island, St. Count County, and Kings County, we're serving the whole Southwest region. You can skip this slide. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so just to let you know where they are, we're, uh, the, the, this project's hosted in a variety of different um, organizations, but interestingly, in lots of chambers. So the chamber stepped up and, dis and uh, agreed to host this project, the CBDC in Southwest, um, and uh, the John Howard Society and Miramichi is maybe the out outlier like Kaleidoscope. So generally there has been a, 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 a close connection with the business community. And that's it, folks. <laughs> so I now offer if you have any questions or... I'm not going to be argumentative with you at all. All right. <laughs> You'd like to sign up? <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> I, I, I assure you I've signed up several times. 
Uh, I must say I'm, I'm too young probably to apply for it, but other than that, I retired 20 years ago. Uh, I retired from a major firm called NBTEL, which is fairly big. Uh, after retiring, walking out the door, I was called back in and asked to start a consulting firm. After one year consulting by myself, I had 22 re retirees working for my company to supply services to companies like Mariner Partners, Nortel Networks, 60,000 employees in Nortel Networks. They're bankrupt now, but they're gone, but we didn't have to cause that and also provincial government. So I assure you, I have got lots of experience, and I think what you're doing is phenomenal, fantastic, and I support you a million percent, because we had, do have a lot of experience. I was, I was using my phone here, and I was trying to find something, I apologize for it. I think the movie was called The Apprentice, and uh, I just forget who was the actor, main one, but he retired, and uh, basically they couldn't find somebody, and he wrote his resume, and when he did the job, he went back in, and he actually was a value, value add because a lot of the younger people didn't have the background or experience. So what you have come up with tonight, my dear, I compliment you, and I support you 100%, not like the last project. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, Council Eastman, you haven't spoke tonight. We'll let you go first. Yeah. I also applaud your efforts, and I've worked for firms across the country after I retired as well. The downside of this, and I'm the devil's advocate of the group here, the downside of this is, is the wages. When you get the wages, they factor in, they either the company that you're working for or your employee will factor in what you're making on your pensions. And again, if you don't have a carrot, such as a, a tax break federally or provincially, there's a lot of guys that are not going to bite on this because that, that's the downside of it at all. I mean, I worked for three years after I got out of the service for a company called Callion that uh, is a pretty big company itself. And in those three years, I made almost nothing, zero. So uh, actually, I spent more money than made. So uh, it's, it doesn't pay to be retired, to be honest with you. It doesn't pay to work again. Thanks, sir. Yes. Please. So just to respond, so part of what we do is also counsel retirees around pensions should they have them. But I will tell you that most of the retirees, and I've signed 25 in my first six weeks uh, in Charlotte County, retirees to this program are working out of need. So they may only have their CPP and their old age security. They're, we're moving out of a generation where people have actually worked for a company for 35 years and they leave with a nice pension and a gold watch and a clock for their mantle. That doesn't happen anymore. So, um, uh, but we do provide counseling around financial um, issues. We are also going to be doing, uh, because we're just starting, some public forums for retirees around financial management, talking about what you can earn um, to, you know, that golden, the golden area that you're referring to where you're not going to lose by working. Councillor Rodas. Hi, Leslie. Thanks for your presentation. Um, one thing I wanted to throw in there is when I was at Extra Mural, actually, um, we had some of the similar challenges, Councillor Eastman was saying, where nurses were finding they were coming in to step up during COVID and doing casual work, but working too much. But I still think um, for a lot of people who have those essential skills, especially in the healthcare system or the social work field, um, I'm just wondering if that's something you're thinking about approaching those healthcare teams, because I do think there is a way to to you know, do that financial coaching and then actually have some nurses who can come back and just do casual work because casual work is actually very challenging to fill in the healthcare field, um, especially with nurses who have families at home. So if there are you know, healthcare teams that would be interested, I'd love to send them your way as well. May I respond? Go ahead, Leslie. So um, uh, my grand goal is that I would be supporting people as they leave the workplace should they wish to hear about this project. So if, and specifically in healthcare, that's my background. I worked for 27 years for the Alzheimer's Society and um, really know that, that workplace challenge. 
Um, I ha we have already signed up many health care providers in Charlotte County and also the Southwest region who are looking for employees uh, in that labor market. And um, I had a couple nurses sign up just at the last job fair in St. Andrews. So we will be working with them. We do also have in, um, when we showed our staff list, Dawn Cunningham is uh, retired also. Um, and she is a team member, a pairing agent, and she's specifically working on healthcare. So I'm really proud to share that. Okay. You got Councilor? Uh, great initiative. Uh, mm -hmm. Could you leave a card or something or something belong that, uh, not for me personally, now come on. Um, no, we have, a, I'm on a museum board, which is, we find out it's really hard to get people to work at the museum in the summer times. So it's only like three or four months, but it's, um, we've had a senior probably there one year before, but it'd be nice to get that connect between yourselves and, and people that really want to, people don't even realize that that work's available for them, right? Yeah. More response, Mr. Mayor. So just to say in St. Andrews with um, the number of mu small museums that they have in their area, there are actually people driving from St. Stephen to St. Andrews to support the work that's happening there, retirees. So maybe they don't know that the opportunity is available there. Um, but just a note, two of the retirees that I matched at St. Andrews with the museums had personal histories with the museum. So that was really interesting. You know, their family had lived there at one time or they were caretakers of that museum. So they bring built in knowledge. Um, so I'd be happy to support you with that. You got one? OK, <laughs> Councillor Otis. Um, the other thing I found as a social worker, there's this strange kind of gap where I would see a lot of men in their 50s who had, you know, potentially a heart attack, that they didn't qualify for Canada Pension Disability because the heart attack didn't fall in the disability sector, but they weren't able to work maybe at the flake board or other jobs that they may have had um, kind of that hard or like on the ground labor. So do you support persons with disabilities as well? Um, and also, I have a question about literacy rates. Like, do you find that that's a challenge as well? Because I know that 50% of New Brunswickers are functionally illiterate, which means they can read like basic signs or papers, but anything like very in-depth is just more challenging. So I just wanted to clarify if you support persons with disabilities and um, people with literacy challenges. Uh, thank you. Yes. Um, so I have found that to be a challenge in Charlotte County already with some of our retirees that literacy is an issue. Um, so yes, we are supporting people. We work very closely with our other partners. So the working um, NB gals here, um, and Marianne and, and others, and the workroom uh, to support people to complete the tools that they need for job search. And um, the introduction I do to a business includes some of that information with permission. Everybody signs consent, so if it supports a successful match, um, I want to make sure that the job I'm sending somebody for is also something that's going to fit for them. Um, for people with disabilities, we are working with some of the other, there's lots of employment services, um, honestly. And so we're all working together depending, and we're now referring back and forth. So I'm getting referrals from working NB and I'm making referrals back for other people. So yeah, there, any door is the right door. Okay, okay Emily? <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Leslie. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I know. I was thinking that. One, one tough one. And now we're going to do another tough one. Okay, so next up. Uh, oh, no, I am skipping one. Sorry. I was jumping into a tough one. Yeah, yeah. Okay, strategic planning. The floor is yours, Jeff. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, what we've got before you is the summary document uh, that our facilitator, Mr. McIntosh, and I um, worked on to summarize the, the work that we did over the, the two days um, of joint session between the uh, department heads, the council, the BIA, the chamber, the future St. Stephen, um, all having inputs, and I thought it was really uh, a, a beneficial um, discussion. Um, what I really wanted to bring to council's attention um, shows up on what is marked as page 16 of 21 in my agenda, uh, which is the strategic priorities chart 
um, which I can I'm gonna slide under the screen just for ease of reference. Um, so you'll see there, we've tried to capture the, uh, the prioritization work that we had done um, largely on day two of our sessions. Um, I am happy to tell you that much of the things in the now category have been actioned, you know, while we were drafting this document, we were also actioning those items. Um, and uh, the bylaw review, say for, for instance, number two, um, there's, you'll see a document, it looks a lot like this one actually, uh, that I've done, designed around the bylaw review, making a game plan for that. That'll be part of my CAO report that you'll see in two weeks. Uh, the community safety um, work is ongoing. Uh, you'll be seeing, receiving a presentation uh, from, a, from a consultant at your community council meeting and some more commentary from my office as well. Um, the unhoused options um, had a very successful discussion with, uh, with Ms. Chase from Horizon uh, this afternoon, um, working on some, some plans around that. Uh, so things are, are, are already moving on this plan that, uh, that you guys put, put together over the last couple of days. Um, and you'll see in the bottom sections, we've already uh, administratively, I've worked on uh, assigning um, many of the things to, other, to, to my team. Um, these uh, will be updated periodically within my CAO report to council. Um, so you guys can see how, how we're progressing. And uh, I would suspect by next month, we'll be having a conversation at Committee of the Whole um, regarding what's moving from the next box up into the now box. Um, and and constant, we'll be constantly updating that. Um, one thing that, uh, <laughs> that I'll note, if anybody, anybody who has a cell phone today, um, probably got the alert system, um, the wonderful alert system that GNB was testing that we're not allowed to use. Um, which still I think is ridiculous and, and should be a focus of advocacy uh, for this council um, to work with uh, UMNB and others to, to push that um, rather than us all having redundant systems. Um, so this, uh, what, this is here for a couple of reasons, one for knowledge, one for to, if there's commentary from council, it doesn't have to be tonight, um, just to make sure that uh, we've captured um, accurately enough for your liking um, the starting point and uh, as you see, you'll, as I say, you'll see in my CA report in a couple weeks, a uh, document looks very similar for the bylaw review process, uh, as well as the, um, the policy review process, which would be a little different uh, approach to that one. But to make sure that we're, we're getting through the things that we, one, are legally required to get through, which is the bylaws, um, and the, the policies which um, my team that, that's worked with me since I got here knows has been on my list of to-do items uh, for the last five years, it's now we've got this nice uh, motivation to get through it and get it done. Um, and probably in two weeks' time at your council meeting, you'll see a recommendation from me to actually rescind about uh, 18, uh, I think it is, policies right off the get-go. We're going to try and clean, clean up the, 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 the junk on the edges, and then, so, and then we can focus our work on the important stuff. So um, things are going to be coming fast and furious at you. And... Uh, I think, I think Councillor Eastman at one time mentioned uh, drinking from a, from a fire hose. Um, and uh, yeah, fair warning, it's coming. There's gonna be a lot of reading in your packages over the next little while as we push some things through. Um, but I also think we're, all, we're gonna be able to deal with some important issues, uh, especially to the rural residents who are, we know are concerned about the bylaws, of how they apply, how they don't apply, which ones will, which ones won't, um, which is, You'll see in May, because it's our first step, it's going to be a lot of housekeeping stuff, not so much the stuff that's going to impact the rural folks, um, kind of easing into the system a little bit, um, low-hanging fruit, as we, as, we, as we may call it. But come the June meeting, we're going to start seeing more. We're going to, I think we're going to have more robust discussions around um, specific language and bylaws and specific applicability. Um, so it's uh, looking forward to that. So um, kind of a, a, just a touch base tonight. This is where we're at. And if you have any comments or concerns, obviously t tonight's fine. Or you all know where to find me in, in my office and in my email um, regarding this document and, and as we update it. Uh, it's it's going to be a live document going forward. So it's there for your, your consideration and questions if you have them. Uh, Council Cornish. Keep calm. <laughs> uh, I'll commend you on the person that you handled or hired. Uh, I did, I did that type of work for half of my career. The gentleman you brought in, we talked the same language. 
the documentation that's in front of me, what I've seen so far, appears to be within the right depth. And uh, I think the crew around the table here, the councillors, had a lot of input. And I think that uh, finally you got a strategic plan that we are part of. And I think that uh, you, you build and manage that. And uh, I was impressed with the actual sessions. So I'm not going to growl at you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any other good comments? Questions? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> you got another one in you? All right. Thank you, uh, Jeff. And like I said, it, like Jeff said, uh, he and his team, have, uh, they presented this to us. And if we have any questions, uh, you can always uh, go through it and, and talk to the team or Jeff. Anyways, okay. Next one and the last one. Uh, the topic is uh, tents in Elm Street Nature Park. So, f first off, do you want to, yeah, go ahead and start, Jeff, because I know we've talked a lot about this. Uh, thank you, Richard. Um, we had this, this topic to the agenda um, as it was obviously a, a, a growing concern at the moment, a, a hot topic, um, and the timing lined up perfectly for this meeting, so it was uh, timely. Um, obviously, I know councillors have received uh, commentary from the public. Um, we've certainly been uh, administratively and operationally seeing um, things develop and uh, wanted to come sit with you. Uh, and as I said to a, to a citizen who, who emailed me, um, we, we too as administration are looking for clarity on, on council's desired outcomes and, and, and tactics um, so that we can make sure that we're, we're carrying out the will of council. Um, some of the things that, that come into play in Elm Street Nature Park I was working on this afternoon. Uh, the municipal district does own two parcels of land in that, in that area. Um, I'm clear out, right? Um, there's one large swath of land that we actually manage under a lease arrangement, um, which has certain obligations as to what can and cannot happen uh, on, on the site without the, the lessor's uh, permission. Um, a, a housing encampment on, the, on those lands would not be in line with the lease. Um, our early indications uh, or early reports I've gotten from the field are that that piece of land is not where at least the majority of the activity is happening. Um, it is happening on MD owned land which does uh, uh, make things a little more easy, a little easier for council as far as you weigh your options because um, we don't have some, another legal element hanging over our head like the lease. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's it's not an easy issue. I understand that for council, and it's not easy for administration. So, uh, as this is a committee of the whole, we know we don't make decisions here. Uh, we do discuss strategies, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, uh, engaging council in, in any strategy, strategic discussions for addressing the concerns of the citizens, the needs of the of the, of the population that's taken up residency there, um, and how best to uh, to move forward. So, uh, with that, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Mayor. All right. Uh, so I, guess, I guess we'll get kind of get this ball rolling a little bit. I mean, I've, I've kind of asked these questions before, but I'll ask them here in public. Is, is uh, what are our options? Like, if we want to remove them, wh how would that look? I mean, I know how it would look in many ways, but I mean, what are our options on moving them to another location or anything like that? Is um. Sean? Well, um, if we were going to move them, apart from just saying leave, um, if we say leave, they're going to go somewhere else. Um, that could be another park. It could be somebody's backyard. They're not going to leave town. So it's either that private land owned by citizens or public land owned by the town or some other business or whatever um, so that's what we've been doing for this is my third third year of of dealing with this um, so you know if if we don't have some place to send them specific they go where they want and that's that's the problem uh, we can run them out of Elm Park Elm Street Park tomorrow well, maybe they're in Dover Hill maybe they're in Cove Park, maybe they're, you know, who knows where they're going to go. Um, 
So that, that is the issue, and that's what I've been looking for guidance on for, well, going into the third season. Um, if they're on parkland, there is a bylaw that says you cannot camp overnight in parkland. So by, we can go in under the bylaw and say you can't, can't be here unless we choose to permit that. If they go on private property that's not a park or owned by the town, there's nothing we can do. That's a, that's a private landowner issue. They can call the RCMP and, and we really have no, nothing that, as the town, we can do. So that's what we've been, been juggling with. Go, we're into our third year now, juggling with that. So that's it in a nutshell. I understand the struggle, yes. Uh, Councillor Harding. Thank you, Your Worship. Well, I think this is a pretty sad situation. We've got constituents, people in the town who are upset. We've got, if we leave them in the park, it's going to upset people. If we move them somewhere else, we had them in Milltown for years, for three whole entire years, we had them in Milltown. Nobody wants them. Why could we not approach the province and asked if the province could get more bids for these people in the attic center, or whatever you call it, and that way they could be moved from the park to these centers, these beds. It Doesn't that make more sense? They could get the help that they needed? My God, giving them a, an egg and a piece of bacon in the morning isn't giving them any help. We should contact the province and see if they can get us more beds. On the news about a month ago, there was eight beds in Campbellton and 12 beds in St. John. Now that's just 20 beds, but surely to God, there's some more beds somewhere for these people. Thank you, Your Worship. Yeah, good, good points, Councillor Harding. Uh, Councillor Wright. I believe just before we came to um, the meeting tonight, there was another email to council from a citizen stating that a lot of the tents had been moved out as of, I believe it was just today. Um, so I'm not sure what triggered that, I, but. I can comment on that. But. Uh, so anyway, I just, I just didn't know if something had happened in between when this letter was drafted, Mr. Mayor. So that was all just my comment that we had received another email. Thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Rodas. So I agree with Councillor Harding. It is really complex um, because what I'm thinking about is we're kind of in this juggle. Honestly, things take time to develop. So something I've done as a counselor is I did speak with Heather Chase from Horizon Health because she's a community developer and they look at, you know, the entire community and how it's being impacted with things like this. So. Um, if the public noted too in our strategic plan, like as a municipality, we can't take on some of these larger social issues on, you know, a wide, we can only take on so much, I guess. So operation, we need to look at operationally what we can do, but I do agree with Councillor Harding, like this is more of an advocacy issue where we need to kind of lobby the province into giving us what we need to be able to support these individuals. But in the interim, because things take time, weeks and months, my concern would be it's warmer outside and I just feel like it may take the province a couple months to step up and actually do something and it probably won't be realistically until October or November before people start talking about another warming center. So I'm wondering, I think as a council something we need to look at is if we move them out of these public lands that are owned by the town, we are putting our private citizens at risk of having very complex issues where people are on their property or in their backyard and we already know from anecdotal evidence within the town that the RCMP aren't able to respond um, or aren't responding or when they are responding, you know, they're not getting, the, the citizens aren't finding that very helpful. So that is my major concern. I. For the citizens on Elm Street, I worry about them. Um, I worry about the park and people not being able to access the park. But my only fear would be if we go in and we remove a large group, we are also putting you know, many backyards at risk of a more complex situation, whereas at least Sean can go in and deal with this, whereas the RCMP are kind of going to be all over the map, and I don't know. So maybe we want to talk about other municipal land that may be more feasible to 
offer up. I don't know um, what other counselors think about that, but I mean, our citizens also need to be able to use the park. So maybe I'll, I'll give that to Sean. <laughs> Go ahead, Sean. Well, some of the concerns, I mean, we hear it all the time. They're, they're leaving garbage behind. We're worried about fires. Where is their sewage going? It's that's impossible. I can go and pick up their garbage. You know, if they move from one spot, they leave their belongings behind. We go, we go pick it up. It's a shame. You know, I'm throwing five hundred dollars worth of clothes into a dumpster I'd, ten times a week. And but if we had them in one location that we controlled, we can manage the garbage. We can put out garbage cans. We can collect the garbage on a daily basis or two every couple of days. We could put in porta potties, so we're controlling the sewage. We can put in safe fire pits that we can approve that we know have a, a, a safe perimeter around, so that you know if they light a fire on a night they shouldn't be lighting a fire. The risk is lower uh, than if they're hiding in the woods, you know, behind somebody's house. I'd be more concerned about that than some place that we can control and create a perimeter that makes it safe. Um, I know it's not desirable. I don't know where that place is. We've racked our brains for three years. Where, where on town-owned property in the municipal district close to the things that these people need and want, um, where would that be? Still don't have a good answer for that, but if we can find that place, people liking it or not, we do have some control over trying to mitigate a lot of the concerns that people have. We can, you know, there was a big talk about needles. Well, we can put needle boxes, and if there are needles there, we can control that. We can't control it right now. It's, it's, it's everywhere. And I'm just running from ditch to ditch, gathering stuff up, and as I see it or as somebody calls me and tells me it's there, not good either situation is not good but at least we would have some control if we say this is where it is we're going to control it we're going to make it as safe as it is it's not pretty but at least somewhat controlled that's what i've been looking for for quite some time yeah i mean the, the things that you're speaking of is you know things that they've been doing in the cities you know and it's just it's in our backyard now so now here we are dealing with it uh you have the porta potties the hand sanitizing stations the garbage and and they're and and they're they're that's not what they're doing uh but it's just, it's 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 a tough spot we're in here because like i said I'm, I'm looking at a crowd right now that uh, don't want it in their backyard right now but i'm also if we move them they're going to be another crowd looking at us right there too so i i just i i, I want to uh you know ask council to uh you know, give you guys guidance on what we want to do as council, but I, I just don't know what that answer is, but uh, maybe we might get something here. Council Eastman. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, along with Sean, agreement on that as well, because uh, when we, we went down, Councillor uh, Greenlaw and I had a meeting with uh, Scott uh, McKenzie, and uh, they are, are talking the same talk as you're talking. One location, easy to monitor things, easy to keep things in control. And, uh, you know, out of all the people that we see m uh, moving around here, there's only about four or five disturbers. And once they get those guys under control, the rest of them are just docile. They just want a place to flop. That was it. Yeah, just, yeah, go ahead, John. The other point of this is, and you, you hit it, they're, they're really, I mean, we've got the statistics say about 63 or whatever, but there's, there's four or five that give them all a bad name, okay? Um, if we had that place, what I understand from watching what's going on around the world, if they have a place they know that they're safe and is their own, they will police that. They'll, they'll have their own mayor, they'll have their own fire chief, their own police chief, right? Because they don't want to get kicked out of there. If we give them something, you know, a place where they can keep their possessions so that if they walk away, I'm not coming in and going like this and throwing it in a dumpster. Um, they, they will kind of police their own, and, and if you're getting out of line and you're going to bring, you know, by law enforcement, the fire department, the RCMP, they'll, they'll deal with that internally as best they can. They will help us. I know that sounds crazy, but it's, it's real. It's real. So another benefit to bringing them together. 
Okay, go ahead, Councilor Hardening. Well, we have people here from the area, so hmm. maybe they could speak up on a few issues. If you're comfortable getting out there, there is camera here. Just, yeah. If, if you feel comfortable. I, I mean, we've all heard your concerns and, and understand them completely. So, you, I, I, but. Well, yeah. I think you know that I've looked at You, you, you got to go out to the podium. I think you know that I've probably looked after the trail in conjunction with some other people for the last seven years. It's in good shape. The bridges are all rebuilt. Everything's set. I, I feel it's pretty good for a decade now with just going and cutting the odd leaner. So I think when we probably first started working on it, there was five or six people a day, way less the winter. I think we're at 40-ish now. They use the park trail. So I just want clarification, sorry, when you say use the park as citizens walk in the park or staying overnight? Oh, walking. Okay, sorry. I just want to make sure they weren't tenting. Okay. No, so, okay. No, sorry. They're not tenting. I... And uh, the tenting part, there's, so I'm there a lot working and I pick up garbage when I see it. So there's more now than I picked up in the last seven years. And that's happened in the last week. And I walked part of it, me and Mary Lou walked part of it last night, and uh, there's an X tent site, and another spot there's just two sleeping bags, and there's evidence of three fires. And then there's a tent behind our house, which I I'm very confused on whose land it is, but there is some evidence that that's town land. And it's from here to the, so that tent is from here to the front door of GCC. And I can't see it from the back deck, but if I take a few steps to the left, I can see that tent. So that's where they're hanging out. And they had a fire in a good spot, in a spot that was cleared last year where the woods crew went in. and. But they've left, so they've heard. And as an admin on the Elm Street Nature Park Facebook page, I got a flurry of people joining, and I'm wondering if some of them are homeless lately. So I, and I've let them all in, and maybe they just heard a few things. Um, I, do, I do have a question, because it just would be interesting for us to know. but. Prior to the warming center closing, did you see the activity in the Elm Street Park, or is this kind of newer since it's closed? What is it, two weeks, last two weeks, roughly? Yeah. So that's, that's just good for us to know, because obviously, like I would say, in hindsight, the warming center location, not ideal, right? Downtown, around our businesses, there were a lot of challenges. I don't think long-term the unsheltered working group is you know, I, I think we all looked back on that and said, okay, we learned a lesson from that and that might not be the most ideal spot, but it is good for us to know that since that closure, it has created some more tenting. And so, I mean, the this has happened every year. It seemed busier and fuller this year. We've had it every year that I can remember, right, Candace? Yeah. There's been at least one tent. And uh, yeah, so this year it was busier, it was fuller. The truck that I saw pull out the other day, uh, he was loaded with tents, sleeping bags. You, you know, I can't tell as it's driving by, but that's what he's got, ground sheets. So they left. They left a fair, not a great deal behind, but it took me a while to pick it up. But. Anyway, maybe it just being out in the public is one thing, but there is a tent 60 meters from my back door. And, uh, and they're not causing me any grief either right at the moment, but, but the, the fire issue might. Yeah, the fire okay, issue go ahead. Is a real concern, just to clarify, there is a tent still in our back 
backyard and there are people still living in the the nature park but it's not a lot of them have moved out and um, so I guess what we're looking for is um, you know how do we go forward do we want to um, you know put up sacrifice the Elm Park for the homeless people is that what we want to do or is there some other alternative that we have that could um, put them up I, I like the idea that um, Councillor Rodas puts forward about trying to help them and 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 the fire chief you know try to help them find a place that they can go I'm hoping that the town council can put forward a, um, some kind of um, plea to the government to help these people because I in our world today should there be 70 individuals that don't have any place to lay their head or or to put their possessions so that hopefully maybe they can get work employment you know like that's a very sad state of affairs I think so I'm all for helping them but I don't really want to sacrifice the Elm Street Nature Park for that endeavor and I hope the rest of the people here don't want to do that either so yeah so may, may, maybe what our goal tonight and I don't want to be slow moving like other levels of government mm -hmm. and say that we're going to look for a piece of property and, and investigate it and see how it fits and then bring it back to council. But I just, we do want those wheels to move somewhat fast, I guess, uh, if that makes sense. I don't know what yeah. council yeah. thinks of that. Yeah. Yes, uh, council. Oh, jeez. Um, I guess my light is on. Um, also, what I, I'm really worried as well with the, the, the people that are here because from what you're saying, it's increased, right, from last year. So if we don't do anything, I can see in the future where it's going to increase further. We're, and even if we move them somewhere else, it will continue to increase, but I see our position is that we have to do something, uh, like Councillor Harding mentioned, maybe um, go to the government. Like, what can we have that's going to decrease the number as we go along? I don't know what it is, but I, I really think that we need to be proactive, that we need to do so that they can decrease or you know, we can offer different situation for them, offer them help. Okay, Mr. thank Mayor. you. Thank you, Councilor Wheaton. Uh, oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Hold on. It's a hard show to get in on here. I yeah. uh, wish I had this hallelujah moment that I had a strategy that was all encompassing, but I think we'd get a Nobel Peace Prize if we ended up with something tonight. But I do not, uh, and I agree, that we can't have them in the, in the Elm Street Park. I mean, it's, and we're just getting new infrastructure in there as a, as a dog park that has, that's gonna be set up soon. And I just don't think that's an appropriate spot. I mean, I, I haven't taken my dogs there for, oh, about a month or so now, and then I don't really feel like going up there right now. So it kind of deters me from there. And I know other people are being deterred as well. And uh, that's a spot that was set up for people to walk in a park that be safe. So, you know, like, uh, so I, uh, I don't agree with that, but I do agree with the strategy that we have to have them. Yeah, I don't like to use the word them either. Those oh. individuals in a certain spot and get help, that's a great idea, but I think that, you know, I th it's, yeah, it's voluntary. They have to go and agree to go to those beds, right? So that's another wrench in the whole thing. I mean, I think it's a great idea. I think they need help. I think their the beds are open. They should go there, but you can't, you have to talk to that individual. And if they don't want to go, they don't want to go. They'd rather go camping somewhere else. And it's, it's a really hard situation that we're in. And I just don't know the solution and everything. I, like I said, I, I've talked to people all around the world and they're in the same boat and they can't come up with anything. But I think we have to come up with something at least to try right we have to try. and that's what we did with the warming center and it doesn't matter it just seems to come back on council though if we don't get to there but uh you know we we have to canvas the provincial government uh, i hate to say that 
Um, I'm torn on Elm Street Nature Park. In some respects, I think that's the perfect place because people. One of the big concerns that you hear is we don't want to see that. We don't want tourists coming in from Maine to see that or coming from into town. So that would that would take care of that. They're kind of out of sight. But logistically, to put in porta potties and go in and collect garbage, almost impossible. So from that standpoint, that's not the place. Logistically, you know. I hate to say it, but the border arena parking lot. We can, you know, I'm not, but I want to use an example that we, it needs to be accessible so that you can do these things. But how do you get accessible and out of sight? That's we've got to be able to get in. Like you can't, we can't be walking into the back of Elm Street Nature Park to log out six bags of, of garbage. That's not going to work. So it's it's got to be it's it's tough. I'm not suggesting border arena parking lot, but logistically that would be easy. <laughs> oh. Okay, I thought you meant the building, sorry. Okay, now we also have a school out there too, so anyway, uh, Jeff? Uh, I was just gonna interject your worship. Um, the, the, well, the discussion's good. Um, uh, we're getting very close into trying to find mm. find solutions, and that's not the purpose of this committee. No. Realistically, what I'm what I'm hearing, and you guys can confirm my understanding, is that the direction is that administration needs to take a look at potential sites, whatever they are, evaluate them against their criteria, and bring back a report saying, "Here's nine sites. Some are good logistically, maybe bad for other reasons," and put that package before you so. That at a council meeting so that you can render a decision saying these ones are in these ones are out now go do a more in-depth costing and things like that like we need to do this systematically it's, yes it takes time yes we can try and deal with the the immediate stuff you know now but in you know I don't, in two weeks time when we're sitting here as council and you're in decision making mode we can have a little bit more information to to sort the you know the potentials into Yes, continue looking at, you know, more in depth at those, drop these ones, right? You can make that decision based on basic criteria and go from there. So that would be my, my understanding from the dialogue for the committee. And if that's, if that's confirmed, we can take that as direction. Okay. Yes. Councilor Rodas. Okay. So I, I've been racking my brain. A, I do think criteria is important because I think no place is a good place and the whole community is going to struggle with that. But if we can create some sort of criteria that Jeff can present to us to just say, okay, has to be this far away from a school, has to be this close to amenities or it has, you know, create that criteria and then follow it. And then that way we can at least present the public that no option is a great option, but we've done our best. Second thing I think would be really great is if Jeff continued to meet with potentially maybe Heather Chase, future St. Stephen, and got those key players in the room, I would like to see them actually get together without any elected officials in the room. I think if we step away from that conversation, Kathy Bacchus is not involved, and it is just simply, you know, key players who are working in this to collaborate, that they will be able to, you know, have some conversation and present us with something um, additional and then third piece obviously is we just need to support Sean I think we should actually follow Sean's guidance on where he feels the most accessible places to deal with this operationally because we don't have a solution that's quick for him so I think we need to kind of take his guidance on that as well but I think there are organizations in this community looking at longer term solutions around housing um, but as far as like the the quicker kind of warming center shelter type thing I I don't anticipate that happening this summer to be honest like I think that conversation is just not really happening so we need to be realistic about that and just you know we're not looking at anything like that until like November so I think we just need to be realistic that Sean is going to be dealing with this all summer and we just need to support him and kind of following his lead on whatever works best that was well said thank you oh Candace, so you gotta get up to that that old podium over there. I just have a question. Yeah. 
question for um, for Sean Morton. Um, we are very concerned in our area about the fires, and there's a no bur no burn uh, order out right now. So, what are we supposed to do when the fires are there? It's 40 acres. There's the hydro field through there. So we have a, a lot of concern in our neighborhood for that. And there has been fires and fires cited from the homes. And so it's it's just a huge concern. And I just want to know what what um, we should be doing. Any fire in town, mm -hmm. homeless or not, mm -hmm. uh, if we're in a sorry, if we're in a, a non burn condition, which we are right now, we will extinguish it if it's reported. So report it and we will extinguish it. If it's in a permitted burn time, then that's one of the questions we need to answer. If, it, if it's on our property, are we going to enforce that? That's what I need for guidance. Um, and if, if it's on your property or on your property, you can call at any point and say, I don't want that. Please come and put it yeah. out. We, I mean, will, just, we, will not, we won't refuse mm -hmm. to put them out. It's, you know, this morning at 6 o'clock, it was minus 3, and, you know, that's pretty chilly when you're outside. And I understand how that's their method of keeping warm um, when, you're, when you're tenting. Uh, even when you're at Oak Bay Campground or anywhere, you're, you're keeping warm by a fire. So, uh, you know, but comes with that, the 40 acres, and, and I know the... There's a lot of dry brush, and there's a lot of trails that the fire trucks can't get down. So that makes a huge, so the, the more vigilant people are about the fires, the deeper into the, into the park they're going to go with the fires, and then there's more danger. So I just, you know, we're, you know, we're concerned about our homes, we're concerned about our neighbors, and I just, you know, thank you for, you. so you will go and extinguish there's fires in a no-burn? Yes. Yes. Um, and that's the exact problem we saw last year. Mm -hmm. you, you chase them and they go further into the woods. Mm -hmm. And then it gets to the point where we're not even capable of getting in to put the fires out because they're, you know, mm -hmm. 4,000 yards beyond where I can do anything. Mm -hmm. This is one of the dilemmas, so yeah. I can't control that. Mm -hmm. This is why I'm asking for a better yeah. solution. Thank you. All right, Blaine. I just, I just want to say this is real quick. Uh, activity in the Elm Street Nature Park by the people that use the Elm Street Nature Park will probably help regulate this. The more they see us, the more we're out. There was, it works, it works. So hopefully everybody goes back to using Okay. They kind of, and they may just be going deeper into the woods, but mm. it works. No, no, and I appreciate that. That's right. More activity. Okay, let's let's end this and let the team get to work and uh, see what they can come back with. And I appreciate what you guys got to have to do there. It's a tough one. Thank you. All right. I need a mover and seconder to adjourn. Councilor Eastman, Councilor Harding. Any questions? All those in favor?